what we think about God matters. What you think about God matters because your image of God directs and affects your life. And in Exodus 34, verses 6 and 7, God tells us exactly who he is. Yahweh, our God, has a name. And this means he's a relational being. He wants us to know him and relate to him. Yahweh, this repetition of his name indicates that he's separate. He's above any other created thing. He's not created himself. He's the creator of all things, both seen and unseen. And he has a name, Yahweh, to distinguish him from any other little g gods. The compassionate and gracious God. This is God's primary character trait. He feels compassion for us, and he's merciful towards us. He acts on our behalf, slow to anger. God gets mad, but it takes a lot to tick him off. Abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands, and forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin. Yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished. He punishes the children and their children for the sin of the parents to the third and fourth generation. Now, Read this part out loud with me, wherever you're at. All right, you ready? I want to hear you here. Here we go. Exodus 34, 6 and 7. You ready? Yahweh, Yahweh, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness. When God says he's abounding in love, this is more than just a a feeling he has for us. And that's why it's paired together with faithfulness. When life gets difficult, so many just bail. You know, when it's no longer fun or it's no longer easy or it's no longer new, when it gets boring or it gets hard or uncomfortable, we just leave. We leave jobs, churches, friendships, marriages. We cut ties and move on, which is even easier for this new generation raised on text messaging and Facebook where You can cut ties without any sort of personal interaction or a phone call even needed. You just ghost the person. God's not like that. He's faithful. God's love is his faithfulness. God's faithfulness is his love. Abounding in love and faithfulness means God never abandons you. He sticks with you no matter the cost. Now, this does raise some questions. If God's so faithful, then how did I end up with adult kids going sideways? How did I end up in an unhappy marriage? Why am I still single? How come I have this chronic illness? Why did I have a miscarriage? How could they win the election? How could my best friend sleep with my fiance? Why was my child born with special needs? How could... I get fired. Why am I in so much debt? How come my mom died of cancer? How come these people who were supposed to be my friends turn their backs on me? Why do violent people seem to be getting away with rampant destruction? At times, it's hard to reconcile God's faithfulness with, well, life. So let's see if we can work through this together and discover what it means when God says he's abounding in love and faithfulness. First, we can't fully understand God's love and his faithfulness faithfulness without understanding covenants. Covenants are from another time and another place. In biblical times, a covenant was a promise. I, I promise to do this. And like a legal contract combined into one thing. It, they were far more relational than legal contracts are. They were far more relational than what we're used to. Two or more people would promise something, and then they would seal that promise with a covenant that had clearly defined blessings and curses for keeping or breaking the promise. In our culture, really, the closest thing that we could have to a a covenant that we could identify with would be marriage. 
Now, I know marriage is kind of taking some hits from culture, but biblical marriage is intended to be a covenant. When you get married, you leave behind your individual lives, and there's consequences if either party doesn't keep the promise to love and be faithful to one another. And divorce is often a consequence of one or both partners not honoring the marriage covenant to love and be faithful. The story of the Bible is Yahweh making covenants. A a key promise in the Bible is found in Genesis chapter 12. Now, Yahweh's perfect creation has been marred by sin and wickedness and evil. It's been defaced. But Yahweh has a plan, so he speaks to a man by the name of Abram. Later, Yahweh will change his name to Abraham. This is what he says, Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. Now Yahweh said to Abram, leave your country and your relatives and your father's house and go to the land that I will show you. I will make of you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great. You will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who treats you with contempt. All the families of the earth will be blessed through you. Notice first, Yahweh says says to Abram, I'll bless your family, and then through you I'm going to bless the world. That's a staggering promise that Yahweh is giving to Abram. But notice Yahweh doesn't promise Abram uh, wads of cash, and a condo in Hawaii. God does promise to bless Abram and his family, but this does not mean Abram's life is going to be easy or have no hardship or struggles. The focus of the covenant between God and Abram is that Abram's family will be the way that Yahweh is going to bless the entire world. Abram likes this promise that Yahweh makes to him, and so he obeys. That's a key to any covenant between God and people. We are to obey, and Abram obeys Yahweh. But the years pass, and he and his wife Sarai, later Yahweh will change her name to Sarah, don't have any kids. And now he's 75 years old, and she's 65 years old. How are they going to have a family that's going to bless anyone? It's at this point Yahweh says, okay, Abram, That promise I made you, I'm going to seal it with a covenant. Now, this reassures Abram because it's a part of his culture. And so Yahweh tells Abram to get a bull, a ram, a goat, a turtle dove, and a pigeon. And those animals, except for the the birds, Abram cuts in half. And he lays them out in such a way that there's a pathway between them. I know it's super gruesome to us, but it wasn't to Abram. It was a part of his culture. It was called cutting the covenant. And there's nothing really in our world to compare with it exactly. The closest thing would be a legal contract. But again, a covenant was stronger than a legal contract. And normally, the two parties to the covenant, they would walk through between those animals. They would walk the pathway between them and signifying that if we don't keep the promises we're making, may this be the result for us, blood and death. But in this instance, it's only one people's, Abram, who's making this covenant. The other being is Yahweh. So what's going to happen here? Well, Yahweh causes Abram to fall into a deep sleep. And while this happens, Yahweh appears as a smoking pot, like a cooking pot, smoking. A a smoking cooking pot and a flaming torch. And he passes through those animals. He, He passes through that pathway. Now, I know it's bizarre, right? It's weird. But it's also super important. It's a powerful moment because Abram doesn't walk the path between those animals. Only Yahweh does. 
in doing this, Yahweh signifies, I'll keep my promise no matter what. And if there's any blood to be spilt, it won't be yours, Abram, it'll be mine. I'm willing to die just like these animals to keep my promise to restore the world from evil and sin. And hopefully your mind is jumping ahead to Jesus because that's exactly what's being promised here in Genesis chapter 12 and, ch and chapter 15. Yahweh is promising Jesus is coming. The rest of the Old Testament, really, the entire Bible is all about Yahweh making covenants. And it's all about Yahweh faithfully keeping his covenant with Abraham's descendants, who eventually become known as the nation of Israel. And then they fail, they fail over and over again to keep the covenant. The Old Testament is not a series of short stories with moral lessons. It's a brutally honest, uncut story of Yahweh's faithfulness to his people, the nation of Israel, and Israel's struggle in return to be a faithful bride to him. But always in the middle of this mess, Yahweh's at work, continuing to bless his friends and even to bless his enemies. And eventually, into this wicked world, sinless Jesus is born. Jesus is Yahweh in the flesh and blood. John chapter 1, verse 14, the apostle John tells us, so the word, now that's God, so the word became human and made his home among us. He was, and this should sound very familiar to you, full of unfailing love and faithfulness. To describe Jesus, John quotes Exodus 34, chapter, verse 6, where Yahweh says, I'm full of abounding love and faithfulness. Jesus is the living embodiment of Yahweh's unfailing covenant of love and faithfulness. Yahweh made a promise in Genesis chapter 12, and he sealed it into a covenant in Genesis chapter 15. And when Abraham and Sarah failed, Yahweh was still faithful. When their son Isaac and his wife Rebekah failed, and on and on, Yahweh was still faithful faithful, when the nation of Israel failed, when David failed, when Solomon failed, and going back even farther than that, when Adam and Eve failed, Yahweh is still faithful. And when you and I fail, Jesus is still faithful to bless, to heal, to restore, to renew, to save. Jesus takes all our sins, years of sin, everybody's sin over all the generation, years and years of that, and he drags it, literally, you know, he's carrying the cross himself at first. He drags it to the cross, and he absorbs those sins in his death. And then he breaks sin's hold over us through his resurrection from death. Yahweh made a promise way back in Genesis 12. And he was faithful to the point of death. And he's still not done. He still keeps his promises Jesus will return, and it's all because of Yahweh's unbounding love and faithfulness that we can look forward to a world set free from death, a world set free from sin. We have a hope that isn't like anything this world offers. Our hope is the absolute expectation of good based on who God is. Our hope is based on Yahweh's abounding love and faithfulness. Our story is the same as the nation of Israel's story. Our story is the same as Abraham and Sarah's story. Like our spiritual parents, we fail over and over again. But Jesus is faithful, even when we're not. But there are times when it doesn't feel that way. When it feels like God is anything but faithful. When Sarah is 90 years old, and she still hasn't become pregnant Oh, yeah, you're faithful, all right, God. And we all have these yeah, but moments. How is God faithful? I just went through a nasty divorce, and now I'm left to raise two kids on my own. How is God faithful? My dad died when I was 10 years old. I was just diagnosed with spinal men meningitis. If God is so faithful, why am I in so much pain? Well, remember the covenant? What has God promised to us? 
Well, yeah, he promises forgiveness of sins. He promises these great things, eternal life, always to be with us, a peace that passes all understanding. But does he promise an easy life? Does he promise health and wealth? Nope, he does not. The promise is primarily to bless the world through us, his people. When the Bible says God is faithful, it does not mean we'll never experience suffering and pain. Far too many people assume God's abounding love and faithfulness means a life without hardship. So then when tragedy of any kind strikes them, they feel like, well, God's not loving, God's not faithful, I don't even know if God exists. But that's a complete misunderstanding of God's promise to us, that he's abounding in love and faithfulness. Jesus actually makes this promise, John chapter 16, verse 33. He says, here on earth you will have many trials and sorrows, but take heart because I have overcome the world. It's not that God doesn't want you to have a rich and satisfying life. I believe like any good dad does, he wants you to have a rich and satisfying life. It's just that he's also, like any good father is willing to do, he's willing to, di to discipline you because he's more concerned about your long-term character, where you're going to end up long-term, than your short-term happiness. Plus, God doesn't always get his way what he wants. Hang with me here. Not yet. Jesus teaches us to pray, your will be done on earth, Father, meaning there are plenty of other wills at play on earth. Many of those wills are at odds with God's will for your life, sometimes even your own will, right? As I see it, God can make good out of evil and sin, but he's not responsible ever for sin or evil. He's not responsible for things like cancer or disease or abuse or violence or even our own mistakes. None of it comes from God. Sin is a cruel invader into this world, and it's brought with it all kinds of evil. But tragically, many people don't see it that way. Now, I understand we don't know completely how everything works, but I believe a lot of people are angry with God over stuff that he has absolutely nothing to do with. Blaming God for the death of a loved one or for the failure of your business or for anything is really kind of like your kid or your grandkid or your niece or your nephew coming to you and saying, hey, I got a bad grade and it's because of you. For many who are immature or confused, God easily becomes a scapegoat. And then sometimes Christians, and I know I've said these things myself, and it's coming from good motives, but sometimes Christians, we, we kind of make things worse when we say things like, well, God is in control. But is he? Of everything? Even evil? Are you sure about that? Is he more powerful than evil? Of course he is. But is he the author of it? In control of it? I don't believe so. I believe the story that the Bible writers tell is much more complex. They tell us that God's will is just one will among many in this present world. Every person has a will. And God patiently sorts through all of our wills and all the mess we make and others make and giving ample space for free will decisions and then graciously bringing good out of all of that mess, even out of evil. And he contends with the wills of Satan and other evil spiritual beings who are intent on violence and destruction. This is why Jesus tells us to pray, Father, your will be done on earth, because there's many other wills at play here in this present world. The Apostle Paul encourages us with this hope, Romans 8, 28. He says, we know that all things work together for good for those who love God, for those who are called according to his purpose. What this means is that when lousy stuff happens to us, that's clearly not the will of God. We or a loved one develop cancer. 
We lose a close friend or a loved one to death. We fail at a marriage or a job or even at a test at school, etc. Even then, God is far more powerful than any sin, any wickedness, any evil, any just mistakes or failures on our part. And he can turn all those, all those things, evil, mistakes, sin, he can turn those things around into good. Our hope isn't that nothing bad will ever happen to us or that everything that does happen to us is somehow the will of God. Our hope is that no matter what happens to us, Jesus rose from the dead. And that means anything is possible. Yes, sometimes things go wrong, but the resurrection of Jesus dows our hope up to an 11 out of 10, reminding us that God is greater than any evil, greater even than death itself. The empty tomb overpowers any hardships, any suffering we ever face with the promise that Jesus will make all things right in due time. If not today, then tomorrow. God's promise isn't that you'll strike it rich, marry your dream spouse. Now, these things might happen to you, but this is not his promise to you. God's promise is not that you'll strike it rich, marry your dream spouse, be famous, or or be always completely happy. God's promise that he is that he will bless you so you can be a blessing to others. God makes you right, forgiven, so you can help others be right, forgiven. And one day, Jesus will make all things right, and all evil and wickedness will be done away with. In the meantime, are you mirroring, are you imaging your heavenly Father? Are you abounding in love? Are you faithful? Have you allowed God's faithful love to infiltrate your heart, to infiltrate your mind? Is there someone you know who needs Jesus' abounding love and faithfulness? I bet someone came to your mind immediately. A son or a daughter, a co-worker, a friend, a, a parent... Have you given up on them? Because that's the temptation, right? Just to give up on them. But Pastor Kevin, you don't know them like I know them. I might not know them, but I know a lot like them. I have them in my life. And I know it's a struggle to not give up on them. But as long as they and as long as we have breath, we cannot give up on them. Because our God, who's abounding in love and faithfulness, has not given up on them. And we need to keep asking Jesus to reach them. And why don't you take a moment right now to pray for them by name, those you know who need to experience God's unfailing love and faithfulness. And then I'll close this out loud in prayer. Heavenly Father, you heard every name we cried out to you, and Jesus, have mercy on them. Have mercy on us, and may we rest in your abounding love and faithfulness in the midst of any pain we may experience here. May we rest in your abounding love and faithfulness in the midst of any hardship or tragedy or heartache. We ask for your will, Yahweh, to be done on earth and for you to take any evil and make good out of it. We ask for your protection in Jesus' name. Amen.